Let me begin by thanking Bill Dembski, Bob Marks, John West, and others who have helped to choose this very interesting and timely and extremely important topic, artificial intelligence. When they first told me that was going to be the sort of core theme, they were going to do other things as well, I thought this is important in practical ways people are worried about. Are we going to lose all our jobs? Are the robots going to do everything? But there's another dimension to it that has to do uh, with theology. Uh, what can our artificial intelligence tell us about whether, in fact, there's something unique about the human mind? Uh, can we ever ultimately duplicate that? Because if we can, then that means that uh, we're just a biological machine. Uh, indeed, if there's something uh, to us that's more than just the neurons in our brain, if we have a soul or a spirit, and somehow our special creative ability uh, is embodied through that, then artificial intelligence will always be just that. It will never ultimately be able to simulate it. But that's a question that's up for grabs right now, and I'm really glad uh, that Bob uh, and others are going to be working on that. I might add, Bob's been doing a lot in this area uh, quite in advance of this, so this is not a new beginning for him. It's really an opportunity for him to build on the impressive uh, uh, work that he has uh, uh, done previously. I would like to thank my long-term friend and colleague, Bill Dembski. I don't think Bill's here tonight, is he, or have I just not seen him? Yeah, he's not here. I've been looking for him. Uh, Long-term friend and colleague for many, uh, for naming the center uh, in my honor. Bill is one of the great heroes of the faith for his seminal work uh, in the battle to establish not just the compatibility of faith and science, but also the positive synergy, uh, which I think is there. I've learned a lot from Bill, and I've uh, been blessed a lot by his uh, friendship over the years. Uh, as I was thinking about what I could share briefly tonight in just a, a little time that I have, uh, a parable from the book of Mark, chapter 4, came to mind, and it's the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, those of you who are familiar with this talk about how the mustard seed is the smallest of seeds, yet when planted, it produces one of these great, huge trees. And I thank my journey uh, with regard to, our, uh, to the event that we're having tonight was one that was very much like that because when I was first encouraged to get involved in, in faith and science uh, as a topic, I really didn't know a lot about science, particularly life science. My area of research is uh, material science and engineering and all the things I deal with are dead, okay? Uh, they're interesting, but they're also dead. And the, the idea that <clears throat> I could maybe use that background in physics and chemistry, which was indeed very strong, to be able to explore also some of the questions having to do with the origin of life uh, was uh, something that I, that I took on at the beginning with a lot of misgivings about what, if anything, I might be able to do. I really had a mustard seed, so to speak. Sometimes we plant our mustard seeds and then we are surprised to see over time that they can indeed produce something much bigger and more significant than what we would have uh, imagined. For somebody whose background is material science and engineering, in some ways, I was not a promising candidate to uh, co-author a book with two friends on the uh, origin of life, but in a way, it wasn't a big stretch because the area of material science I work in is polymer science and engineering. And so I know a lot about polymers. I know a lot about polymer chemistry. I know a lot about chemical thermodynamics and kinetics. These are all important questions uh, that one deals with in the origin of life area. So for me, this was not really a beginning from scratch. No, I had a good fundamental background to examine some of these things. Uh, I want to mention John Buell tonight because John Buell was, uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here tonight, but he was the person that was very instrumental in getting me involved in this activity. He asked me one, at one point, why don't you uh, write a book on evolution? And I said, because I'm not a biologist. I, my last biology course was in 10th grade, and I hated it. So... <laughs> It was just memorize everything you could imagine, names, parts of everything, you know, the file and all that. But uh, so I told him I didn't think I would be interested in that, and I certainly wouldn't be qualified, but I told him uh, I would be interested potentially in doing something on the origin of life. And he said, well, okay, uh, that sounds like it's kind of in the same category, although they're two very distinctive sets of questions. And so I told him I would be glad to explore it. I had no idea of what I would find. And as I started reading the literature and analyzing it using my background in chemistry and, and uh, physics, 
it was very clear to me that the contemporary stories of that time, this is 1976, 1977, were absolutely like science fiction. They had so many claims and so little basis, and I was appalled that you could have refereed journals that all seemed to talk about these things as if they had real uh, merit and real explanation and so forth and so on. And it seemed to me as an outsider that this simply wasn't the case. I spent a fair amount of time reading the literature, and then uh, John Buell again uh, stuck his nose in my affairs and said, uh, uh, would you be willing to give a talk on this at Colorado State University in a biochemistry class? And I thought, hmm, uh, maybe that's getting out of my safe, my uh, security zone, uh, my safe safe place. But I thought, if this, is, if this is true, then it ought to be true in a bio, bio, biochemistry class, right? I ought to be able to go any place. And one of the best things you can do to test your ideas is to go talk to people who are on the other side, who don't agree with you. And so I took the opportunity to go. Uh, it was a senior class for biochemistry students, 100 students in the class. Five professors came. And the title I gave was Thermodynamics and Kinetics of the Origin of Life. Now, I gave a talk, and at the end, I expected some hard questions or people would take issues and so forth. And most of the questions were softball questions saying, wow, we've never thought about this before. Uh, in fact, some of them confessed I didn't like physical chemistry or I never took it, okay? And so they didn't really have the background to even ask these kinds of questions. And I began to see that a lot of this was people working in fields that maybe they didn't have a fundamental background sufficient to do the work, work properly. And in some cases, uh, they uh, simply didn't want to deal with the shortcomings in the theory. At a Gordon Research Conference, after we wrote our book, I had a guy who was fairly famous, uh, got a 25-year medal for his work in Origin of Life, and he came up and he said, I should have written this book. And I said, why, why didn't you? <laughs> and uh, he said, it's like this. We all get our funding in the Origin of Life research area from NASA. Now, we're all using the same theory, and I agree it's never going to work. Uh, we need a different theory, but we don't have one right now. And he said, if I'd written the book and uh, said the emperor has no clothes, the theory we have now is not ever going to work, then we couldn't get our research funding from NASA, and we would all be unemployed in the summer, and everybody would be really ticked at me. <laughs> and I thought, I thought this was all ideological, right? No, it wasn't ideological. It was very practical. It was people needing summer research support and so forth. And so sometimes the reasons people stick with these theories is just because of some very practical considerations. Uh, in reading the textbooks, uh, uh, I started reviewing textbooks about the same time that I had started working in this area, and I was curious to see how the textbooks would treat this as uh, college-level biology books, in some cases high school level. How, how would the book, uh, textbooks treat this subject? And they treated it in a way that was so superficial. It was a lot of hand-waving. They took the Miller-Urey experiment and acted like, oh my gosh, we can make simple building blocks if we just put these gases together and, and spark them. It turns out that all of the gases they're talking about never existed in the prim primordial atmosphere. So they were running experiments that had no correlation with the real world situation and then making claims that see how easy this all happens. Uh, happily, over the last 30 years, that story has gradually changed. It was much more gradual than it should have been. But in the last uh, uh, textbook reviews that I was involved in in Texas as one of the official reviewers, uh, they were actually telling the truth about the Miller-Urey experiments. They were actually talking about the fact that uh, uh, these are interesting historically, but they're not that significant scientifically because they don't use the right gases, then it doesn't have any particular relevance to the origin of life. Um, when we went to the first Gordon Research Conference after our book came out, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the fellows came up, six, seven people in total came up and said that they, they liked the book, which I was happy to hear. These are uh, Gordon Research Conferences on the Origin of Life are one of the two main kinds of conferences where all the best known researchers go. And six, six of the people came up and said, I read your book, I really liked it, and uh, uh, I thought it had a lot of interesting and, and justified uh, criticisms. I had one guy that came up and said, I didn't like your book at all. Uh, and I said, why? And he said, because it's too damn good for a creationist book. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I took that as a compliment, okay? I took that as a compliment. But uh, it's, it's been fun to see how God can take even simple startings that don't seem to have much promise. When I started uh, reading about the origin of life 
I wondered what I would find. I wondered if I would find anything. It was entirely possible I would read the literature and say, well, what they're saying makes sense. Uh, uh, but it was quite amazing to me to find out not only did it not make sense, it really uh, was not uh, credible uh, for all kinds of basic reasons. It wasn't a speculation. It was a flat out-and-out -out mistake. In 1986, I went to an uh, international conference on the origin of life. It was at Cal Berkeley. Uh, all of the main researchers from around the world came together, about 300 of them, for this conference. And um, uh, they had a plenary session in which uh, uh, the speaker did something that I've never seen before. It had to do with the origin of life. And he said, people have been claiming that RNA can be made under prebiotic conditions. And he cited some references for uh, 1986. And then he said, uh, they were quoting people from 1985. And they were quoting people from 1984. And as you went backwards, you went back to all of those citations being people telling other people, telling other people to one reference. And if you read that one reference, it basically said, hmm, we never did find RNA in our prebiotic experiments. And it had been quoted for that many years, all the way from 1969 to 1986, that life began with RNA and it can be made under prebiotic conditions for 17 long years. He went on then to give five absolutely powerful arguments about why you cannot make RNA under prebiotic conditions. At the end of his presentation, all 300 people are sitting there and they always have questions. No questions. Not one question. And then the, the person who was chairing the session kept saying, well, can't, uh, can't you, somebody ask a question? You know, it's not normal to have no questions. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, particularly on an important topic like this. And finally, when nobody would ask a question, he basically turned to Bob Shapiro, Robert Shapiro, and he said, Bob, I, don't, uh, uh, I, I can't criticize your presentation today, uh, and nobody here can, but do you have to be so pessimistic? And I thought, how interesting. Robert Shapiro was one of the two people that did jacket endorsements for our book. Now, the things that he had in his book, in some cases, duplicated some of the things that we had said, not necessarily that he got them first from us. Uh, he had some other things which we hadn't thought of, but I felt like it was really amazing that we happened, and this is John Buell again. He talked to 27 publishers before he found a secular publisher. We did not want to be in the Christian bookstore. We wanted to be in the science section of major bookstores. We wanted to be in libraries. After our book sold 2,000 copies, it was actually put in... All the libraries buy every book that sell, sells over 2,000 copies. And so passing that, meant it appears in most libraries. And I used to go and look at the libraries when I was out of town to see if they had a copy of our book, and almost all of them did. Uh, it was, to me, a project that at the beginning I had no idea that it would go as far as it did. I had no idea that we would, by God's grace, be able to discover important, interesting things about this whole process. I Trotter, my good friend, and I were doing book reviews in 2013 uh, for textbooks in Texas, and an organization called the Texas Freedom yeah, Network, uh, really mis misnamed, uh, but anyhow, they put out public uh, uh, press, con press things to be able to uh, tell people about what we were doing and how it was a bunch of creationists, and they were trying to sabotage all the textbooks. And as one of the paragraphs they had, it said, all of the people who work in Origin of Life today more or less agree on how life began and uh, that uh, there's, there's all the credible scientists are, are agree about that. Now, that is such a big lie because none of the people in the field would have said that. This guy was obviously making it up. So I sent to several of the newspapers. One of them wanted to do an interview because they wanted to know if what he said was really true about what I was going to say about the books. And so I quoted a... Uh, article from one of the two major journals on origin of life, and it was called The RNA World 50 Years Later. Okay, 50 years later. And it begins by saying, 50 years later, synthesizing RNA under prebiotic conditions is the bi a biochemist worst nightmare. And then it went on, the whole paper talked about all the reasons why nobody can seem to do this. So going back to Shapiro's book, this is almost 50... Uh, 50 years after his conference, the presentation in 18, 1986. 
and the problems were all still there. They had not been solved. And yet here's a guy putting press releases out to papers all over the state of Texas saying everybody knows how life began and it's not a big deal, not anything to worry about. And it was just so unbelievably false. Nobody who works in the field would say that. Uh, so, well, enough said about stories. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm so excited about uh, what the uh, uh, new and artificial intelligence center is going to do. And I certainly hope that in some uh, ways I can have a part of that. And they've expanded the mission. I know nothing about artificial intelligence. Uh, but I know about some of the other things that Bob was mentioning about. And so I look forward uh, to working uh, with uh, the, the group and uh, uh, advancing the, the cause of making us, helping us to see truth as it really is, to explore reality as it really is, and then to be, uh, I think, uh, good at communicating that. Uh, to a culture today that desperately needs to hear truth in many, many different areas. I mean, it's really, uh, our uh, situation is probably worse than it's been in my lifetime. Well, thank you for coming and uh, uh, for being a part of this program this evening, and I look forward to seeing some of you in future programs uh, that hopefully we'll be having on this topic. <laughs>